All right, now we're gonna move into the next session, which is integrating EGFR inhibiting therapies into clinical pathways for first line non-small cell lung cancer treatment. This is an educational session that is supported by an educational grant from AstraZeneca, and it's gonna be presented by Dr. David Jackman. Dr. David Jackman is a medical director and of Clinical Pathways and a senior physician at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Welcome, Dr. Jackman. Thanks so much for having me this morning. Um, when the uh, Congress asked me to present about EGFR, I'm trying to think about how to make this not too wonky, um, but yet to, to talk a little bit about the story behind the EGFR development and how, that, and how the science has really affected clinical pathways, and, and more importantly, to try to use this as a means to think about other issues in pathway development, particularly in lung cancer. Um, these are my uh, disclosures. Um, and these are the learning objectives that were stated in your program. So there are currently five EGFR inhibitors that are approved for first-line therapy in non-small cell lung cancer. And as we think about, about this, you know, I think it's important for us to recognize they are not all the same drug, right? This is not um, ranitidine. Uh, you know, this is not Zantac versus Pepsid, right? That they, they, they all have kind of some unique properties to them. They are, you know, they differ in, in their side effects. They differ to some extent in their mechanism of action. So as we think about these things, it's not simply, well, let's just pick the cheapest one. And so what's our goal, right? Throughout every step, when we think about a clinical pathway, we're trying to figure out, ultimately, what's the best treatment for the patient in front of me now? And we, you know, we try to boil it down to, well, you know, what's the most effective, what's the least toxic, and what's the most affordable? And that sounds, you know, right to everybody. I don't think anybody's going to disagree with that. But these answers are obviously much more complex and nuanced, right? Most effective by what? By sur overall survival, progression-free survival, least toxic in terms of overall toxicity, in terms of the really serious toxicity toxicities, you know, by quality of life measures, and most affordable in what way? To the system, to the payer, to the patient? How do we think about all these things, and how do we possibly put this together to make some sort of pathway that makes sense and, and provides some overarching guidance? So how do we frame the question, right? So at all points, we want to think about the science that, that informs um, the decision-making um, and, and, and think about the clinical activity um, and the effect on patients, and obviously want to think about cost and value. And so I thought it best to talk a little bit about the EGFR story, recognizing that all this data doesn't happen in a vacuum. It happens over time, and how the story is told over time affects how we think about things for better and worse. And so we start in the late 1990s when, when pharma recognized that the EGFR protein was present on about 60 to 80 percent of non-small cell lung cancers, as well as a lot of other tumors. So they developed drugs, both small molecules and antibodies, against the, the, the wild-type protein in the hopes of seeing, well, maybe something will work. They put them in clinical trials in the late 90s, and, well, and let's see what happens, right? And, and it's not that they get responses in 60 to 80 percent. They get responses in less than than 10 percent. But man, those responses are incredible. They're dramatic. And in many cases, they're durable. And perhaps importantly, they're also seemingly predictable. When we start using these in clinical trials, we first recognize that they're more likely, these great responses are more likely to happen in specific patients, in patients with adenocarcinoma histology, in never smokers, in patients of Asian ethnicity, and, and, and in women. And so we take this to the bench, um, and folks at my institution, Dana-Farber, as well as Mass General, start to sequence the receptor to try to figure out what's different about the patients who respond versus those who don't, and recognize that these series of mutations that are found in the responders and not in the non-responders are incredibly predictive. I have a pizza there because at the time, my boss, Bruce Johnson, bought pizza for the department every time we did something that changed the way the world treats lung cancer. And so this was one that merited pizza. Pizza. Um, despite the finding of the, the you know, the thinking that this is a targeted therapy based on, you know, our ability to kind of clinically predict who is going to respond, and more importantly, this discovery of mutations, much of the medical establishment was still putting their head in the sand and didn't want at that time to necessarily believe that EGFR mutations were the white, right predictor. You know, we're looking at things like amplification. We're looking at things like immunohistochemistry. And I think this is important because they were trying to ask a different question. They, you know, I think we were, we were all um, moved a bit by how 
dramatic the effects were, you know, what we call the Lazarus effect. We had people who were literally on death's door. They'd get one of these medicines, and some of them would perk up and start living their lives again. And it was this incredible thing to the point where before we discovered any of the science behind it, you know, the, the, the standard of therapy in lung cancer was nobody dies without getting at least a shot at this because, you know, we don't want to miss, you know, the, 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 the rare chance. Um, and so people, I think, didn't want to believe that this was a targeted therapy because they didn't want to you know, didn't want to necessarily have to say to someone, that medicine's not for you. And so it wasn't until finally some more clinical data in the IPASS trial, you know, confirmed that the mutations were really not just you know, strongly predictive, but should differentiate how we think about therapy. In this trial, we saw that patients with the mutations, and this is, um, so this is the whole set, and you see that the, 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 the curves cross in a weird way, those that got EGFR therapy versus standard chemotherapy. But it plays out much more understandably when we recognize that those patients who had an EGFR mutation did much better if they got the targeted therapy. Those patients who did not have the EGFR mutation did much better if they got the chemotherapy. And that's much more understandable. And so then on the, on the basis of this, on the basis of the IPASS trial, this becomes the new standard. So at that point, finally, we accept the fact that we should be testing all of our patients for EGFR mutations at the time that they're diagnosed with lung cancer. And... Um, and, and that if they have an EGFR mutation, that we should be treating them with an EGFR uh, inhibitor. Over time, this becomes even um, more refined for us to recognize that, you know what, we don't find these mutations in everybody. We don't find them in patients with squamous cell carcinoma for the most part. And so we refine this even further, right? So the, the, this testing is just for patients with stage 4 disease because that's where ultimately the drugs were, 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 were approved. Um, and it's only for patients with non-small cell, non-squamous histology. The squames, the small cells, this unfortunately is not for them. And so again, we come back to the fact that we have, you know, several, yeah, several different drugs, um, first generation and second generation inhibitors at that time. And we, and we recognize that not all the mutations are the same. And work done by folks at my institution and Memorial Sloan Kettering and other places recognize that the, the, the kind of mutation still matters. Um, and so that we think about any of these drugs for the classic mutations, the more common ones. But if you have a rare mutation, right now only a Fatinib is approved in these. And so recognizing that they're not all the same thing. They work a little bit differently. They work a little bit differently against different uh, mutations. Um, so then as we move forward, right, we, we discovered that EGFR mutations matter. We discovered that we can point these, um, the proper patients to the appropriate therapy, which I think is incredibly important. But then we recognize that these drugs, while they work great in, in certain patients, they don't work forever, and people start developing resistance. So we think about why do they develop resistance, and, and uh, we made a number of discoveries as to um, how resistance occurs. And we saw that uh, in about 50 to 60% of patients, a new mutation arises, the T790M mutation in the EGFR gene. And so then we're pressed with, how do we overcome that? And so again, folks at my institution did this incredibly elegant set of experiments, first to determine what T790M did. It wasn't so much that it was a steric change in, in, the, in the receptor itself, but that it caused the affinity of the receptor to bond ATP more strongly than the first generation inhibitors. Um, and so led us to then develop a series of drugs in the lab that could bind to the T790M mutated receptor. And ultimately that leads to osimertinib, um, which then in clinical trials shows these incredible responses in patients um, who have progressed on EGFR uh, first generation inhibitors. Um, and these waterfall plots, with every line being a patient, up means their tumor grew, down means their tumor shrank, and so you can see the extent of activity in these patients. And so that was another one that got us pizza. Um, and so, so now, you know, as we think about this, um, ultimately, osimertinib gets approved. Um, 
for the treatment of patients who has, have de de developed T790M mutations as their mechanism of resistance. So that the new standard of care at that point is we test everybody initially, we finally have an EGFR uh, mutation, so we give them a first or gener second generation inhibitor. And then if and when they progress, we re-biopsy them to see what their mechanism of progression is. And depending on what it is, we try to point them to the right next therapy. In this case for T790M, it's osimertinib. And so with that being said, if we recognize that this, the T790M, is, is the, the reason why treatment stops working in more, um, 50 to 60% of patients, well, can we just stop that in the first place? Can we start them with this medication and try to prevent that, that, that resistance from the get-go? And so that's the next set of experiments. So the FLORA trial is a clinical trial in which um, patients with EGFR mutations then are randomized to either osimertinib um, or a first-generation EGFR inhibitor, either gefitinib or allotinib. And so what happens? Um, and so what we see is there was a significant improvement in progression-free survival for the patients getting the third-generation inhibitor, osimertinib for um, and, and I apologize that the uh, magnification on this is incredibly lousy, but the, the, the progression-free survival improved from 10 and change to 18.9, um, which is a dramatic improvement, right? That, that when, when we think about what the FDA has been willing to approve in metastatic non-small cell lung cancer in the past, for the most part, if you, if you improve overall or even progression-free survival by two months, you usually get your drug approved. And so to improve things by eight months um, is, is a dramatic improvement. And in addition, we found found that there was a significant decrease um, in the development of CNS metastases, um, and those patients uh, with CNS metastases had an improvement in their progression-free survival. Wanting to point to one thing a little bit more closely in the proportional hazards model, again, you know, it, 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 the, it doesn't show up that incredibly well, but um, what we can see here is that there seems to be uh, not a statistically significant, but certainly a trend towards even further benefit with the osimertinib in women and in patients of non-Asian ethnicity, which I think is important when we consider the fact that this trial was done 60% in Asia. And so, you know, it would be um, important, I think, to think about how this data plays out in a more Western audience, and would that um, improvement with osimertinib be, for whatever reason, even more dramatic. Um, we don't have overall survival data yet. The, at the time of publication in the New England Journal, the data maturity for survival was only 25% mature. Um, but despite that, the hazard ratio um, was already clinically, uh, statistically significant. So we're waiting for that data to come back, but I think folks are looking at it um, with excitement. And so this is a summary. Um, we saw the uh, improvement uh, in progression-free survival from 10.2 to 18.9. We're waiting on the survival data. Um, the response data is, is pretty flat because the, you know, the chance of response is already so high to begin with. Um, and in terms of toxicity, uh, if anything, it looked like the third generation inhibitor was less toxic in terms of significant adverse events compared to the first generation inhibitor, in part because it was designed against mutated receptor instead of wild type receptor. So we expected there to be um, less skin and GI toxicity. Um, and there was a, 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 a accounting improvement in terms of uh, toxicity-related discontinuation or dose, um, and dose interruption looked about the same. So what's our standard of care at this point? I think, you know, moving from where we were before, that is to say that we should, sorry, um, we should be treating with a first or second generation inhibitor and then treating with osimertinib at the time of progression. Or, you know, I think at this point, based on the flora data, it would be completely reasonable for us to say that osimertinib should be the new standard of care. We still biopsy a progression because there are other mechanisms um, that would point us towards other treatments. But um, in many places, including at my own institution, the data we think is significant enough for osimertinib to become the new standard. I want to talk about a few more things. Um, another competitor for the crown. So a few months, uh, gosh, within the last month, a second-generation inhibitor, dacimitinib, got approval um, for, for first-line therapy um, based on its 
uh, improvement in progression-free survival, again, versus a first-line TKI. Will this take hold? You know, this isn't pre necessarily preventing the T790M. It's a second and not a third generation inhibitor. But nonetheless, the data is enticing. And should the new standard maybe be d dacamitinib and then at progression if T790M do osimertinib? And frankly, we just don't have that data yet. So this is what we have, and it's all against an old standard. And so we're forced as, and, and this is something that comes, you know, throughout cancer, right? How do we compare across trials when the data we really want is data that that we don't have yet. You know, what, one other piece that colors this, though, uh, is, is that recognizing that the second generation inhibitors, um, dacamitinib and, and afatinib, um, tend to be more toxic, particularly with respect to rash and mucositis. And so that has to factor into our decision making as well. Either way, we wind up in the same boat. You know, is, is the data still strong enough for osimertinib to be the current first line therapy? Should we think about something else? I think for, for, for in, a, in a number of ways, for my institution, osimertinib remains the, the, the first line therapy that we recommend at this point. However, we also don't want to put our head in the sand, and, and I think we need to always be iterative and think about if additional data comes out about the sequence of dacamitinib or other second generation inhibitors then followed by osimertinib and if that winds up being better as more clinical data becomes available we need to be willing to, to pivot. So I want to talk a little bit about cost effectiveness because well I think it's important. Um, you know challenges right how do we come up with costs? Um, you know in, there was a um, an ICER um, analysis done by Aguilar um, looking at cost effectiveness um, of first generation inhibitors, afatinib, a second generation inhibitor, and osimertinib. And these were the prices quoted in that article. And they were not that uh, different from what I uh, was able to get in terms of uh, the average wholesale price for each of these medications. And what we can see is um, a, a ridiculous increase in the price for osimertinib. And does that then, based on this, color um, how we think about uh, its use? Do we reserve it for second line? Are we still willing to use it for first line? I think that so many things that, uh, that Alan mentioned in the prior talk come here. Right? Th this is great, and it's good to have this information as we try to make decisions for pathways, but recognizing that that it's just one piece of the puzzle. The drug cost is important, but you know it doesn't tell it doesn't tell me what the cost is going to be for my individual patient. It doesn't tell me what the overall cost of care is, what the treatment is going to be in terms of the layout for dealing with side effects and other pieces. So, so um, while we want to consider this, we recognize we need to do better across the board as we do, as we try to make decisions. Um, in this analysis, um, ultimately, the, 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 the feeling was um, a few things. That um, the willingness to pay was estimated at about $180,000, or um, three times the GDP per capita, and that the maximum price for osimertinib to be considered cost-effective in this model was 12500 And so that's, you know, if they were willing to lower their price, then, then this might then become um, considered cost effective. But otherwise, in this analysis, osimertinib was not considered cost effective, though it might be if there are price negotiations or relatively small discounts to move the needle. Overall survival was the strongest factor affecting incremental quality adjusted life years, and non-drug costs were estimated based on the literature, but not on actual costs and usage. One of the challenges of this analysis, I think, is, you know, I think it was, it was trying to be pushed out to be timely, but if they're basing it mostly on a difference in overall survival, and the survival data was only 25% mature, I think it, it forces us to say, well, you know, this whole analysis um, is going to need to be rethought as we get new survival data because if the survival data winds up being more significant, well, then the cost um, numbers may change. So what now? You know, so, so I think we're still left in this place where there isn't a clear right answer. I think perfectly reasonable people would say use osimertinib first, and other perfectly reasonable people would say, no, we should continue with our old model of a first or second generation inhibitor, reserve, reserve our osimertinib for the time of progression. Um, you know, some people hear Yanni and some people hear Laurel, and I think either way is fine. Um, 
you know, I, I think, you know, other things that are important with regards to immunotherapy that need to be uh, um, in the first line setting for these patients. One is that concerns that immunotherapy appears to be not as effective in patients with EGFR mutations or ALK rearrangements. Um, and so it's, it's not something that, sh you know, we have considered as an appropriate first line therapy for these patients. Um, and, and, and secondly, that the combination of carboplatin, pemetrexid, and pembrolizumab that has become a standard in non-mutated patients had excluded patients with EGFR mutations. So, so as we try to think about how do we treat these patients in the first line, we're really thinking about targeted therapies. So in the last few things that I want to talk about before um, leaving time for questions, I want to think about um, EGFR and, 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 and the path we've taken with this and how it can apply to other parts of our pathways discussions. You know, we talked about, um, you know, there being a balance in thinking about um, clinical predictors and EGFR mutations and, and the limited response rates in the general population. When we were initially trying to think about EGFR therapies, are these a targeted therapy and how do we apply them? You know, and, and we were, I think, colored by the fact that we wanted to believe that anybody might benefit. And there were really two separate camps. You know, one thing about EGFR mutation, this is a really targeted therapy. And others, you know, mostly on the West Coast who were, who were saying, no, we, should, we, we need to look at other markers. And it wasn't quite, you know, Tupac and Biggie, but nonetheless, there were really people digging their heels in. And so thinking about this, right, and, you know, and trying to make a case that this is a targeted therapy, you know, I think that in many ways we can, we can substitute in PDL1 expression or tumor mutation burden. And I think in some ways we're putting our head in the sand in the same way right now, that we're seeing, uh, you know, response, you know, some dramatic responses in patients with immunotherapy. And we want to believe that anybody has the chance, you know, we're, we're, we're such a, you know, we were such an egalitarian country and, 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 and wanting to think that anybody has a shot at responding to these drugs. But yet we look at the response rates and there's response rates in lung cancer, you know, 15%, 20%, not everybody's responding, right? And, and, and ultimately, I'm not saying that these are yet the right markers, and I think that the science needs to catch up, but by the same token, I, I think it's important for us to recognize that these are not therapies that are going to benefit everybody, and, 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 once, and we need to push ourselves scientifically to figure out better biomarker predictors for immunotherapy, but by the same token, want to make sure that, that, you know, that as data becomes available, we're willing to change our, our framework for this as we think about uh, immunotherapy. Secondly, um, what else can we learn from the EGFR story? So, so as, as, as we think about, you know, we started these things in trials back in, in the late 90s. Um, the initial approval um, for EGFR inhibitors in the second line setting was way back in 2004. Over time, it gets a first line expansion. Um, and then, and then ultimately it's narrowed to only be EGFR mutated patients. Um, and as the market narrows, as it goes from, you know, all comers to just EGFR patients, um, the price, you know, increases tremendously from, from uh, when, 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 the, when the EGFR inhibitors, when Erlotinib was first approved, its, its, its market price was $2,400. And I remember us, you know, cursing the skies that, gosh, an $80, $80 a pill, this is ridiculous. And now that seems so naive. Um, you know, and so, you know, I, I think it's challenging, right, that, that we have multiple drugs in class um, of multiple generations. And we, so we have five drugs from which to choose, and yet this doesn't operate like a market, right, that, that, that these prices are going up instead of down despite competition. And how do we think about this? How do we do better um, as a society um, to help think, you know, to help doctors and patients make more informed choices in a way that ultimately this may look more like a market and how competition can decrease rather than allow for increase in pricing structure. Finally, what does this all mean for clinical pathways? Um, you know, so today, you know, I think that based on what we know, we're able to define appropriate biomarker testing. Um, I think we're able to, you know, use pathways as a mechanism to bring people together to assess relevant data and then to do the best we can to determine what we think is appropriate therapy. And then finally, um, 
you know, to, to, as a mechanism to, to educate ourselves and our colleagues about when to biopsy, that it's important to biopsy obviously at diagnosis, but it's important to re-biopsy at the time of progression, and that's something that still hasn't completely penetrated practice, um, but I think is an important piece that we're still trying to teach each other. What's next? You know, so on the heels of, of, of Alan's talk, um, Previously, thinking about cost and value, right? That we need total cost of care, that we need to find patient specific costs and challenges and find a way to bring that to the doc and uh, the treating physician and the patient so they can make um, more sensible choices for themselves, especially when there are reasonable options um, that exist. And then finally, how do we think about this from a multidisciplinary standpoint? How do you develop? Um, pathways that can incorporate things like navigation, things like symptom management. Gosh, when I'm on a fat nib and I'm developing mucositis or I'm developing shortness of breath, well, then that's a different thing for, for a nurse navigator or for a triage nurse to think about than shortness of breath from someone on immunotherapy versus someone who is neutropenic from their cytotoxic chemotherapy. So how do we use these things to help to separate out, you know, what quest, what's the next question that needs to be asked and who does the patient need to see next? How do we think about um, developing, bringing radiology into pathways in a way that figures, that help us figure out um, in, in a data-driven way, you know, how often do we need to be get, getting scans, what scans do we need to be getting, and how can we improve cost and usage um, with a pathways model. And then this is a, my th thank you slide for all the folks at Dana-Farber who helped to create and support our clinical pathways programs. Um, it's, it, as, as you can see, and, and as any of you who have built clinical pathways programs at your own insti institution know, it is a, a tremendously large undertaking. Um, and so I have my direct pathways team, um, specific shout out to Carol Tremonti, um, who is our pathways operations director, our pharmacists, all of the docs who help to actually oversee the building of the pathways. They don't build the pathways, the whole disease center, you know, the whole institution is involved in that. Um, and these are all the people I answer to. Um, so with that, um, I would love to take your questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Jacqueline. For terrific presentation. Give him a round. I'm going to take the podium and you sure. can take Fair this enough. and stand there. Well, you got to love a non-small cell lung cancer uh, presentation that brings in Biggie and Tupac and uh, pizza. <laughs> I enjoyed your talk, it was very good. This last slide is very important to me and my question is, is it's a major effort and infrastructure to create the pathways. How do you maintain them? I mean, it's the real problem is it's a rapidly moving thing. So how do you uh, financially support the effort required to maintain it? How do you maintain the interest? How do you get doctors who are willing to do this effort instead of taking care of patients? Yep. So, so, hello. Oh, yep. There go. Um, you're absolutely right. It is a tremendous effort, and we've done it um, thus far without paying, without, uh, without having funds to pay the docs. We've done it, frankly, on, on, on charm and uh, and goodwill. Um, you know what we've tried to create right now is we have a, a a doc who is the overall pathways lead in each disease center. We only now have started uh, financially reimbursing them, and literally it is starting this coming month. Um, uh, it, it is at either a five or ten percent FTE um, for them, and what uh, depending on you know how how the extent of their pathway. So the GI and GU folks with multiple diseases and pathway um, have more, get the 10%. The folks who are just doing one, like GBM for Neuronc, or at the 5% level. Um, in regards to us trying to be nimble, you know, as new as new things come out, you know, I make sure to, to, to catch up with them and say, how important is this? Is this a game changer that needs to be addressed right now, either because it's a patient safety issue or because, gosh, we can't live with ourselves if we don't address this right now? Or is this, you know, it's a change, but it can wait till our next meeting in three months or whenever that is. Um, and so that's, that's how we're doing this. Um, but all the decisions are being made at the disease center level, not by an individual doc in a back room, that we think it's important that everybody has buy-in to what the content is. And we also think that that's what makes the content better. <laughs> Let me pick up on that, Dr. Jackman. It, for those that are just beginning, 
what's the minimum number of people in, who should be in that room for that first meeting? And how do you position the idea so that you get them on your side for a clinical pathway? Yeah, I, you know, I think that's a great question and, and not simply answered because I think, you know, the politics and such of each group has been different. Yeah. You know, I think in some of our groups, we actually, you know, in thoracic, we actually at attacked it as a whole disease center. And we met, you know, twice a week for about, f you know, three or four months and sat down. Here's small cell and what we're going to do for limited stage. And here's what we're going to do for extensive stage. And each meeting, you know, was a, a little bit of a drag out fight as we, f you know, tried to develop these things initially. Um, with, you know, in other disease centers, we had, a dis you know, an expert in that disease, Peter Enzinger, um, who's a world expert in gastroesophageal, you know, made the GE oncology pathways. And then we brought it back before the group so they had something more concrete to play on. Mm -hmm. So I think, it, it, you know, part of it was kind of negotiating the politics within my own institution. Mm -hmm. um, so there's not one specific model, but I think ultimately it has to go back to the larger group of all the people who are going to be using that pathway. Otherwise, you can't get the buy-in mm -hmm. for them to, to use it, especially at a, at a kind of tertiary cancer institute where, the, frankly, we're all so full of our own egos that I don't need a system that tells me what to do. I'm whoever I am. So, Thank you. Question here. Uh, yeah, this is Rit Panikert, New Century Health. Um, I, I have a couple of questions. Uh, so, uh, firstly, we jumped, uh, we, we developed pathways, and as soon as we had a simertum, or the osimertinib data, we put it as the preferred agent on pathway, uh, did not have the cost-effectiveness analysis at that time, but the, the effectiveness was uh, overwhelming. Um, if you look at the costs deeply, would you factor in the lesser brain mets, the brain radiation required, the health-related quality of life with Osimertin? So that's one question. The second question, in our pathway, we try to be granular about the type of mutation. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're asking for exon 20 um, uh, mutations, and we would not recommend TKI therapy. Um, so what do you guys are, so the second question is, are you granular enough when you uh, recommend TKI? So those are the two questions. Yeah, so it's a great question. The answer is, the short answer is yes to both. Um, in the Aguiar paper, um, they did look at, they did try to factor in cost of uh, dealing with brain mets. Um, they, didn't, they didn't do it based on actual costs. So, so their paper was looking, trying to do a, an analysis based on the flora data, but they didn't look at the actual costs incurred for those exact patients, but rather they took you know, a literature-based cost for here's what it takes to deliver a whole brain radiation therapy and kind of projected it on the percentage of patients who develop brain mets. So, it, you know, it's, it's, it's not an exact analysis, but at least it, they tried to factor it in. Um, in terms of the genomics, absolutely, we, we are also trying to be equally granular. So osimertinib is our recommendation based on the classic mutations, the exon 19 deletions and the L858s, because that was what was included in the paper. But if you have a G719, if you have an L861, um, then, then no, they weren't in the paper, so it's, it's not fair to just extrapolate those. So those were recommending a fatinib because that's the only one that's approved in that space. Um, and then as we develop, you know, drugs for exon 20 insertions and stuff, those are all going to the appropriate clinical trials, you know, poziotinib and other things where we think there's real promise. I have a question for you. You, you brought up the ICER cost-effectiveness data on osimertibib, and it made me think, uh, contrasting to Alan's presentation this morning, that I believe the way ICER does their cost effectiveness is it, while it takes a societal view, it's really just the direct medical cost. They don't consider any of those other patient cost toxicities. And so how do you factor that in, or do you, when you're looking at the cost? You know, I, I, I think the, the, the ultimately the answer is that we, we all need to be aspirational. Right now, I don't have a, you know, when we sit in a room as a pathways committee to, to try to figure out, you know, what should be our recommendation in this setting, or even when I sit in a room as a doc with that patient, mm -hmm. I have no means right now to be able to know what's the cost, what's the total cost of care going to be for this patient based on their plan and their payer. Mm -hmm. I don't have a way to do that. So we're making, we're making decisions based on kind of societal stuff because that's what we can get our hands on, mm -hmm. but that 
that doesn't mean we shouldn't keep trying to get our hands on that next level data. Mm -hmm. And so we, we're, we're, you know, we are, we are working hard to be able to get at the next piece. Have you added cost toxicity items into your pathways yet? Well, so, so cost, every time we are making a decision in our disease centers, I'm making sure that at the very least we're looking at cost of drug. Yeah. Um, um, so, so that's factoring in. But again, you know, and, and, and we're putting things in where, um, you know, recognizing that there may be payer coverage issues. So if they won't pay for the Darvi, or, or I'm sorry, if they won't pay for the, the, the Vemurafenib, but they'll pay for the Dibrafenib, you know, we're making sure that there are multiple things in there where, you know, it might be an issue of payers being willing to cover one but not the other. Mm -hmm. But like I said, you know, we can't, we don't have it at an individual patient level right. yet. Mm -hmm. Question. Hi, my name is Day Hills, and I'm the medical director of a oncology cancer center in um, upstate New York. I frequently refer to Dana-Farber or Sloan Kettering. So one question I have is my patients often want a second opinion. When they go to you for that second opinion in first-line treatment, are they, are they going to be steered to a pathway? And, and sort of as a corollary question, will these pathways be proprietary? So in other words, does the patient need to make the trip? I know you have that, um, you can do it sort of online for a fee. That's not a crowd pleaser I'm finding with mm -hmm. patients. So I just wondered if you could address that. Yep, great questions. Um, so at every step, um, we, <clears throat> we tell our docs, we want you to take care of the patient in front of you in the best way that you can, whether that winds up being on pathway or not. We hope that they find pathways can help to inform the decision and to bring, you know, stuff that, that maybe they didn't have at their fingertips in, in every situation. But they are, not, um, they are not obligated to follow the pathway by any means, nor do we incentivize that. So it's not that they're trying to meet some metric. So I don't, you know, so, so while I think our pathways reflect how, what our general thought processes are, you know, if, if we think that the patient in front of us would be better served by something else, we're going to tell them that. Um, we also hope that our pathway system will help to improve the doc's recognition of what clinical trials might be um, appropriate for that patient. And so we do think the pathway system can help inform um, second opinions in, in different ways. But I, you know, I don't want you to think that, you know, the, the, the second opinion is just somebody's clicking off a bunch of boxes and doing something that, you know, we could have done other, you know, more easily some other way. Um, the second question, you know, the other part of your question, um, are these commercially available or, or proprietary? And, and the answer is going to be yes. That is to say, um, we have uh, formed a new relationship with Philips Healthcare. We are building a, uh, a new pathway platform with them that's going to be part of their IntelliSense um, product. Um, and with Dana-Farber pathways embedded within it, and that will be commercially available. Thank you. Wonderful. And I believe that Philips Healthcare is down in the uh, exhibit hall, and you can visit with Dr. Jackman uh, to find out a little bit more about perhaps um, how to access something like that in the future. Please join me in thanking him for a fabulous presentation.